Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of our team here, I'd like to welcome you to the International Primatology Lecture Series, uh, Past, Present, and Future Perspectives from the Field. I'm Andrew McIntosh of Kyoto University's Wildlife Research Center. And this lecture series is, um, just give me a moment here. Yeah, this lecture series is uh, part of our SciCASP Seminar in Science Communication, which is run by the Center for International Collaboration and Advanced Studies in Primatology here at Kyoto University's Center for the Evolutionary Origins of Human Behavior. And through this whole initiative, we're aiming to capture some origin stories, um, either about the, the, the careers of the primatologists or wildlife scientists that are talking to us, or about the evolution of their big ideas, or just generally get to see what they've been up to over the years, um, and what we can learn from them as we all progress through different stages of our own careers. So this is the 26th lecture in our series, and I'm really excited to welcome a friend and colleague, Dr. Milena salgado -Lin here to join us. And before I hand it over to uh, Mike Huffman, as I always do for the, an introduction, just a very brief bit of housekeeping. If you're watching on YouTube and have a question or a comment, you can go ahead and drop that in the live chat accompanying the stream. And if you're here in the Zoom audience, then feel free to drop your questions at any time in the chat. We'll make sure uh, we get to you later um, during the Q&A, or you can just hang on to it and raise your hand during that and ask your questions directly. So we hope you all enjoy this lecture. And without going any further, I'm going to pass it over to Mike for an introduction. Thanks. Mike. Thanks, Andrew. Milena, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you join our series. Um, Milena and I have been friends for some years now. I think we met first in Vietnam, but we at, at the IPS meetings, and we were both very interested in monkey malaria in Plasmodia nosei and, and the issues going on in, in Southeast Asia. Um, long time has passed since then. We've managed to keep in touch, gotten back in touch lately, and I hope to be working along with you guys in Malaysia in, in the near future. We're um, doing parallel things in some areas, and others are, are things that I have no, no experience in. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all about how you got into the monkey business and the great work that 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 you and your partner are doing in Malaysia. I've, I've managed to, to to meet you both briefly just a few months back. Unfortunately, I couldn't go to your site, so I'm hoping to learn more about what you're what you're doing there now and what your plans are and what you've done. So, without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to you, Milena, and take her away. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Uh, as it should be. Uh, I hope I will do it correctly this time. Um, ah, I think you're watching the the screen as it should be, right? Yep, it's perfect. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you again for inviting me to your lectures, to your series of lectures. I've known Andrew and Michael for, for a while now, as they say. And uh, it was an interesting proposal because I am not really a primatologist. But I do have um, a very strong interest in primates. So um, first of all, I am from Mexico. And therefore, you can understand why in the title of my talk, there is this uh, glyph, which in Aztec, in Nahuatl, it means monkey. So the life and work of a monkey in Saba, which is me, um, and everything that happened before I came to Saba. So I just mentioned to you that um, I, oh, why is it not moving forward? There. Um, I am Mexican and we all start somewhere. So once upon a time, I was a very, really little girl, almost one year old, and I already love monkeys. Uh, as you can see, I have a um, uh, how to say this, uh, something that I share, I guess, with all the people that have been on the, excuse me, on the, on the lecture series. And that's that I have a pet monkey, a pet stuffed monkey. It's not a real monkey, obviously. And this monkey, which whose name is Cheetah, has been with me all my life. Um, and where that interest came from, I, I have absolutely no idea because as you can see in my screen, I come from Mexico City and I have, I had a, a pretty much no influence of forest, of um, 
natural park that was nearby. My family were not biologists. My family were accountants and, and business people. And, and it was the 80s, late 70s, um, early 80s when I was growing up there. And we had no internet. Um, so my my information about primates and, and wildlife in general was very, very limited. So for a long time, I kind of focused on other things. I love to swim and I trained really, really hard. And for many years, I was convinced that what I wanted to be was um, a swimming champion, an Olympic swimming champion. And I guess um, that dream kind of was cut short because of lack of opportunities um, and um, and well, I'm very glad about that because I don't think I was caught to, to do that. And later, when I was growing up, I was never a um, person that had a very defined career path. I know people, my husband is one of them, who was born and knew all the way through what they wanted to be when they grew up. Um, my son is another one like that. They just knew they want to be something, and that's what they did. In my case, it wasn't like that. I loved animals. I really liked primates. I loved going to the zoo and, and watching them, but I felt it was not right. Something was not right about that, and I couldn't really understand what it was. And then my life took me elsewhere, and eventually I, I kind of decided when I was in high school that what I wanted to do was to be an engineer in electronics and communications, um, which was a very interesting choice back then uh, because I I started to learn about satellites and and how there were things about remote sensing and remote things so I thought that could be interesting for me but I was not fully convinced and I'm grateful that in high school I had a subject called um, um, scientific research in the 20th century and and the teacher was so enthusiastic that it really made a change in my life i will always be grateful to her because that's when i learned about genetics and dna in more than mitosis and meiosis uh, biology was always my worst subject but i decided to try and give it a go and that's where my path to borneo started I decided to be a biologist because I wanted to learn more about genetics and learn more about wildlife in general and ecosystems. But during my career, especially when I was in university, um, I tended most to go towards lab-oriented um, subjects. So I ended up doing my dissertation on, on the immune system reacting to dengue virus. I I work in the National Institutes of Public Health um, for several years to obtain my, my degree. And then straight after, I went to, the, to do my master's. And again, it kind of changed a bit. The, the, the disease part was start to be, starting to be of interest to me. Um, but again, I was focusing on cellular biology, mostly this time of uh, amoebas um, in the liver, and, and it was mostly just understanding how how the cell of the of the amoeba worked, how how that organism worked. So by the time I finished the master, I was seriously not convinced that I wanted to continue going on that path of absolutely lab work, no field work, nothing to really do with wildlife. And and then I decided to take not necessarily a break because I started working in the university. But then life made me had a break. <laughs> so I had a very serious um, accident, motorbike accident. And uh, fortunately, I was able to, to leave and carry on. But I was stuck three months in my on my bed, just looking at the ceiling. So I had a chance to really look hardly at what I was and where I was going and what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided that I was studying, I had studied biology because I wanted to learn more about genetics and I just didn't do that. I always liked primates and I never did that. So, so that's how I ended up finally in Borneo. <laughs> I started a PhD in Cardiff University um, under Mike Bruford, um, mostly uh, working on 
population genetics. I will tell you more about that. But my original plan was actually to work on malaria um, of orangutans, not malaria of people. I was already thinking uh, people already have a lot of papus. I really want to know more about diseases that affect wildlife. So, so that was my plan. But when I was one way into the PhD, then we received the news that Malaysia was not going to grant me the permit to come and work in malaria. So we had to change to change plans. Um, and I will tell you more about what happened after that, but, but that was a bit of a big hiccup in my life. I, I was like, okay, I'm already in a PhD. I have my grants. I have my, my commitment to my funders and I have been already one year in. So let's see, let's see what, what I'm going to do now. And at the end, I still ended up coming to the Kinabatangan floodplain in Borneo, which is in Saba. Um, in the previous map, you can see Saba in the north part. Uh, Borneo has, for those who don't know, um, has three different countries, Indonesia in the south, Kalimantan, and then Brunei separately, and then Malaysia with two states, Saba and Sarawak. So I came to Saba to do something in the lower Kinabatang uh, in the lower Kinabatangan wildlife sanctuary that's located in the Kinabatangan floodplain and just to give you a context and I don't know if you can see the video clearly but basically this area is heavily impacted by human activities um there are pockets of forest which are um in reserves in forest reserves or in wildlife sanctuary and it's all surrounded by by this huge mosaic of landscape uh, of uh, of old palm plantations, and and that creates a huge huge impact on everything, absolutely everything. So that already was for me very very interesting. My idea of the malaria was to see what was the impact of that on the malaria distribution of the vectors, but obviously as I said that that did not happen. What did happen though? Um, was that I learned about this. Um, this is the Kinabatangan floodplain. And as you can see in this animation, from 1973 to 2010, approximately 40% of the tropical forest was lost. And then by 2014, that's more or less the end of, it, of this animation. As you can see, all the green part is going. The green part is a forest and it's being replaced by plantations. That's the pink side. 80% are old palm plantations and approximately only 1% of, of that green beet is primary forest only. So this area is a very interesting place to work and, uh, and to understand, see how we can make it better and see what's really happening um, in, the, in the animals. So when I arrived, uh, my supervisor, one of my supervisors in, in Garth University, he had just started Oh, before I go into that, um, well, this area, despite being a, a very severely fragmented area, is very important in terms of biodiversity. Uh, one of the things that will be of interest of you specifically, because you love primates so, so as I do, um, is that there are 10 different species of primates here cohabiting. We have possies monkeys, we have macaques, we have langurs, we have gibbons, we have uh, tarsiers, and, and we also have the, the iconic orangutans. So, so this particular area, although it's very heavily fragmented, is of super, super um, interest for conservation and and for anyone who, who is into primates. And then I was I was coming to, to this bit. When I when I arrived, one of my supervisors had just started setting up Danagrang Field Center. And Danagrang Field Center um, aims to understand the wildlife responses to human-driven landscape changes. As we say, we started in 2008, and I was the first PhD student to be located there. I've been working in DGFC since then, and, and although for a long time my title was scientific advisor, just recently I've been promoted, <laughs> we can say that to Director of Research and Conservation um, because my career has found out and, and I am not longer just doing genetics or prosectology. So I told you that I came here with an idea or to do malaria and 
that just did not happen. So one of my supervisors said, well, I am very much into population genetics. And we have already um, a project that was started there but was not finished. And that's how my monkey business began, really, with DGFC. And I will, I will talk to you about that new project that was part of my PhD and a little bit of all the project that I, that I was coordinating. And all of this couldn't have been possible without a lot of collaborators. Andrew is one of them. Uh, I was very happy to meet him here. Um, Iki Matsuda, who is now in Kyoto, also is one of my main collaborators. I was also working with the London School of Tropical Medical, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, University of Malaysia Saba, and obviously with the Saba Wildlife Department. Uh, we couldn't do anything without the support of the, of the Wildlife Department. So my PhD, I ended up focusing not on orangutans, not on mosquitoes, not on malaria, but in two the in these two guys, uh, which I absolutely love, the proboscis monkeys and the and the long-tailed macaques. I think they are very interesting species. I never uh, stop enjoying watching them. And my PhD had to be a bit of a let's match something together that that fits the funders, that fits a bit your interest, and fits what we can do in the field. So the first thing that happened in my PhD was like, okay, let's see um, how we can learn about the adaptive um, responses. So we tried to do something about MHC. And I have to say that this was the, the one part of my PhD which I focused the least on. Um, I've managed to, to sequence and characterize MHC um, sequences. This is the, the major histocompatibility complex, and it's very important for immune system. There was never done uh, research on proboscis monkeys, MHC. So working with fecal samples, which was very, very difficult, I managed to, to report these five sequences. And here is my first confession and why you should do as everyone says, and I say, but not as I do, I did not publish this. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really um, proud of saying this, but I say this because it's important to learn from, others, from other people's mistakes. Um, I just felt that what I had done wasn't enough, wasn't good enough. So I just, I just was thrown away from, I was put off from, from actually publishing this. Um, I actually managed to, to characterize 47 sequences of, of the um, MHC, the DRB, the most variable region, in long-term macaques. And only one of those had been described previously. But even with that, I just felt that that I I I didn't I hadn't done enough. Another part of the PhD was focusing on parasitology, since my founders had given me um, um the trust to work on malaria, and that couldn't be done, then we had to transform it into some sort of parasitology thing. So we did some sort of um, of internal parasites. And and this was something that had not been done in the region, had done, not been done for proboscis monkeys. It had not been done for long-term attacks in the wild. So we ended up having some baseline information with 14 different taxa. Here I'm just showing you some examples of the things that we found. Um, we had cestodes, trematodes, nematodes, some acanthocephalans, and, and some unidentified things that we never knew what it was. We could see that parasite richness was higher in proboscis monkeys than in long-term macaques, and that these had a um, um, small but still significant distribution in the north compared to the south of the river. So the Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary, as you see, there is the big river passing through the middle of the area. And on the north bank of that river, that's where I found more, more parasites in, in proboscis monkeys than in long-term macaques. And also then from those uh, proboscis monkeys on the south of the river. That's as far as we went. We didn't explore this more. And again, I felt that my work wasn't enough, so I didn't publish this. And again, you shouldn't do this. You should do what everyone says to do, which is to publish and what your supervisors deserve and, and should do. Um, and the last thing that I did as part of this PhD was 
to try to do some population genetics, understanding gene flow um, and structure in the proboscis monkeys and the long-term macaques. They're in the same area. And to do that, I had to do a microsatellite library for proboscis monkeys. So that, that was a species-specific um, marker, nuclear marker, uh, to understand and to be able to do some genetic analysis. And, and I found over 40 microsatellites, but during the PhD, I could only characterize eight. Um, that I published. <laughs> and with those, I managed to, to do some minor genetic analysis. And we saw that the genetic diversity was high, was really high in my in macaques and moderate in proboscis monkeys. Um, it could have been uh, an indication that there was already a constraint in the gene flow um, from outside of the area. Within the area, the gene flow was quite high in both species. And one of the questions about that was because the previous work that was being that had been done by um, the team of my my previous supervisor was on orangutans and and also in macaques and and proboscis monkeys, but but more on mitochondrial DNA. And there was some indication that, that the, the river might be a, a geographical barrier, especially for the macaques, not so much for the proboscis monkeys. But with, with the nuclear markers, we, we actually saw that that was not the case and that this gene flow was quite high in both species. By the time I reached this point in the PhD, I was already quite... Um, convinced that academia was not my way. I could have done it, but I, I didn't want to. And then life puts you things in the path. Um, and for personal reasons, I thought that going on the academic way was not going to be something I could fully dedicate myself. But I, start, I, I kept contributing to DGFC's um, research programs, and one of them was the Proboscis Monkey Conservation Program. Um, the idea was to do a statewide survey and to try to understand uh, the genetic characteristics of the proboscis monkey so they this could be used for conservation. Um, the work that I did in the PhD was the basal work, uh, especially with the microsatellites, to do this more in-depth analysis, statewide analysis. So we went on this program um, capturing proboscis monkeys and we got over a hundred over a hundred animals that were captured around the state. You can see the the points in blue, red, orange. And those were the areas where we captured proboscis monkeys. And and doing doing some Bayesian approaches, we could see that there were three uh, genetically distinct populations here in Saba. Um, one is very clearly located in the in the east coast, and the the two others have a, like a funny shape, like kind of in the middle of the state. That's kind of the the Crocker Range goes through that, and then towards the east, uh, the west coast here in Saba. That's the yellow bit. We could see through the genetic markers that there was low levels of dispersals, but that the population were still genetically fit. We could also infer that there was going to be a decrease of genetic diversity depending on the connectivity. Um, Saba has been highly fragmented with these old bound plantations and also by its own um, uh, geographical uh, topography uh, with a crocker range in between. So we have continued this this um, this research separately with a colleague from Cardiff University, and we have gotten some very interesting results, which are this time on the way of being published. We we are writing that paper, and so I I can't tell you much more about it. But what I can say is that the yellow, the yellow orange um, populations seem to be quite old compared to the others. So. There is a support for an expansion after the glaciation implies it, where the proboscis monkeys actually disperse from the from Mount Kinabalu to the rest of the state, probably using the river systems. Um, but that's something that will be published, and and I hope that you will get to read that in this year. 
At the same time that the proboscis monkey cons monkey conservation pro program was happening, I got involved in this other project, which was called Monkey Bar. Monkey Bar project was um, an initiative from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And what they wanted to do uh, was to understand the risk factors that were causing the infection of Plasmodium nolisei in people. And this is where I met Michael in Vietnam when I went to present the first um, the first results from the from this project. Um, the project was multidisciplinary. There were several components with entomology, parasitology, social science, clinical medicine, and spatial modeling, and a primatological com primatology component, which was uh, coordinated by myself, done by members of the Nagran Field Center. By then, I was not a primatology already, a primatologist already, but I still like monkeys very much, and I was very enthusiastic about this project. I thought it was going to be very interesting to understand how this scheme here, how this di this tentative dynamic was actually working. There have been several publications that stem from this from this research, um, from the other components, from the primatology. From the primatology component, we did some transit observations in some areas in Sabah, especially at the north in the area called Kudat, and in the island of Bangui, that's uh, at the tip of Borneo on the north part of the state. We had some uh, phenology uh, plots. Uh, we were, again, uh, capturing and coloring uh, macaques to try to understand their home range and boosting patterns, and, and because we couldn't go capturing every single monkey, we tried to do some uh, molecular diagnosis using, well, through the fecal uh, material. And monkey bar was really a very challenging project. Uh, it was almost impossible to capture monkeys, uh, to capture macaques. We used several different types of traps and this was done with the support and, and on the experience of veterinarians, from, both from DGFC and the Sabah Wildlife Department. And, and we were not lucky really trying to capture more animals. We, however, of the eight animals that we managed to capture and color, all of them were positive for plasmodium noisy. And, and then there was this particular individual um, who was captured the first in all the project that was in 2014. Um, and if you can see in the in the bottom part, I'm trying to get a pointer. Yeah. Um, so on this side, these on yellow are the movements of the macaque during the during the day. And in, in blue, which you may not be able to be to see, are the roosting places. In this excess, which may not be very visible, are houses. We have this, there was this patch of forest here. And what happened with this animal was that by late April, this area was cleared down and, and burned. So this animal was displayed, displaced. This animal was displaced. And in May, you can see the movement. It was trying to locate an area where it could finally be again. This whole is pretty much part of a lot of his home brain was, was destroyed. This animal was positive. So this gave us an inference that moving um, the deforestation could have an impact on, on the disease risk transmission. By June, July, this animal already had established itself at the north of this, of this road here, uh, reaching other houses. And, uh, and by August, September, it had established a completely new, ter completely new territory again, reaching all the houses. Um, of this, in this project, we, we mostly targeted um, fecal material, but we needed to have some sort of, of method to use. So we were comparing a couple of methods. One of them um, was one that Michael used, and, um, and then there was another method. Um, and unfortunately, we, we didn't really get very good results in either of them. We couldn't use uh, QPCR, for example, uh, and we just had to do with conventional PCR. Um, at that time, there were 
15 captive macaques by the wildlife department. They were coming from, from other areas in the state of Sabah. And we could see that uh, 68 of these were positive for plasmodium noelicide. 68% were positive for plasmodium noelicide. That was when we analyzed their blood. And when we analyzed their feces, we could see that only 33% were shown uh, that were positive. So clearly our method had a lot of constraints in, in which the window of opportunity of capturing the parasite on the feces was quite short. From the wild animals that we capture, about 300, uh, I'm sorry, from the um, fecal samples that we collected from the wild animals that were about 300 samples, 60% were positive for plasmodium and 20% were positive for plasmodium noelicide. But if we take these, uh, these numbers in consideration, uh, it is very likely that that the PK positive were were higher in that area. Of this of this project, um, we came up with only one with only one paper. Again, my academic side was not very strong, and there wasn't enough funding to do a better study of the fecal samples. So this other part of the project was was published, and and one thing led to another one. So we here is where we started strengthening collaborations with other people who were actually primatologists or or special uh, good in special modeling um, or strong parasitologists, and and this is why I am showing here the papers that I've been involved with, but are actually the work of mostly Andrew and his team, uh, obviously with, with the help of people at Dan O'Garen Field Center. So I'm not going to talk to you about this because I would do a disservice to the work of Andrew and, and Liz and everyone else who was doing this, this work in the field. Um, at the same time, we continued our, our interest on, on uh, malaria. Uh, so my collaboration with, with the London School strengthened as well, and that's with Kimberly Fornes, who is now at the National University of Singapore. And we have been doing a few things with thermal cameras to try to improve methods of sensors and, and now using audio mods to try to see um, more things. If we could if we could use audio mods or acoustic monitoring to detect diseases or, or to monitor disease risk. Um, so again, it's a lot of technology-based and, and remote sensing. Um, and then stemming from the from the proboscis monkey conservation program, all those samples, which were a lot, have been um, used by my collaborator, Iki Matsuda, um, understanding things about biochemistry and, and how that could help the diet of monkeys that are captive in zoos. And, and then we continue with other with other population genetics things, um, trying to see some relatedness and, and, and patrilineal um, basis on the multi-level society of the proboscis monkeys. So I've said already that I love primates, but I don't consider myself a primatologist and I don't think I am an academic. I do think that all this work has to be transformed into actions. So so that's what Dan O'Gran Field Center does. We use the information that comes from the research and we try to use it in a way that the government can make decisions that are based on science. We have collaborated with the Sabo Wildlife Department very strongly on this. And, and I'm going to, I want to show you something that really crushed my heart. This is a proboscis monkey dealer in Thailand. Proboscis monkeys are endemic to Borneo. What are they doing in Thailand? How did they get there? What, what are people doing with that? The, the pet trade is, is real and, and the illegal trafficking is very real. So we engaged with the Wildlife Department in doing state action plans. Um, that was in 2017, and one of them was uh, a state action plan on proboscis monkey. But we also did state action plans on Bornean banteng and the Sunda clouded leopard. And 
one of the things that was common for all these species was that poaching, hunting, and illegal killing were a very significant threat to these animals. So one of the objectives of the action plans was to increase the capacities of wildlife law enforcement, government agencies, and key partners in conservation here in Saba, and to train crime analysts, investigators, and intelligence gatherers, gatherers as well as a forensic technician at the Saba Wildlife Health Genetic and Forensic Lab. I haven't talked to you about the lab, but the lab stem from a collaboration with EcoHealth Alliance, Saba Wildlife Department, and Dana Grant Field Center. So we established this laboratory where we really wanted to look into also forensic um, forensic problems for the wildlife department. So the wildlife health and genetic part had been established since 2013 and were flying and going well. The forensic part wasn't. Um, and as part of the management committee for the GFC for the for the for this lab, I was really committed on developing on developing this. Um, why is forensic needed in Saba? Well, the wildlife department um, receives many cases of different different things from trophies to bushmeat to live animals. And, and it's important to know what are these things? Where are they coming from? Um, are there really Sabahan species? Are they coming from elsewhere? Um, in, Mal in Malaysia, the National Forensic Laboratory in Peninsula Malaysia has a, a severe workload, and the cases in Saba were um, were difficult to to manage. So, with this in mind, um, DGFC uh, started to look for funding to to work into implementing these action plans, and we were um, fortunate enough to, to partner with the U.S. Department of State through the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. So that's what I've been doing for the past four years. I've been working on this project, which is called Boosting Enforcement and Forensic Capacity to Deter Wildlife Trafficking in Saba. We have um, three objectives uh, with several activities on each. And one of them, one, one of the objectives was to, to like enhance this capacity of enforcement and investigation in the wildlife department, we establish and train an intelligence unit and also to develop uh, technology-based investigative capacity using real-time camera traps, real-time audio devices, passive audio devices, passive camera traps. And, and that some things didn't work very well but some have a lot of potential, especially the real-time camera traps and the passive audio devices. Then it was also important to enhance interagency cooperation. Why? Because here in Saba, many of these of these crimes, wildlife crimes, are are usually linked with other type of crimes like forestry crimes or fisheries crimes. Wildlife in Saba is protected by different agencies. So sometimes there was not a streamlined communication there. So we established an interagency intelligence working group um, that was jointly trained. And, and we working to put uh, a database, a wildlife crime database, which is now up and running. And, and that has been a, a very big effort from the members of our team. And the idea of, of that database is that we could eventually share information, wildlife crime information, at national and international level, with the um, with the with the most suitable agencies. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes things go to 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 people that shouldn't have been informed, and that compromises investigations. So it has been a very a very long journey, but I am very happy to say that we have provided over over thirty five training sessions in different aspects from crime scene uh, investigation to an, uh, crime analysis, um, uh, the usage of, of smart technology, for example. And, and we have trained over 80 people in these four years. So it has been a very intensive, intensive work. And then the thing that was closest to my heart in this project was the, the development of, of the forensic unit in the, uh, in the wildlife Health Genetic and Forensic Labs for the wildlife 
department. So we did establish a forensic unit and and to establish the forensic unit, obviously much more training was needed, but also we needed to make sure that the lab processes were proper and secure so that there wouldn't be very much questioning for it. And so now our lab is has submitted all, all the paperwork after several pre-audits to have uh, an ISO 17025 accreditation and our forensic um, personnel uh, have also submitted all their paperwork to become certified forensic scientists. So it has been a lot of work in these four years. In this slide, I can just barely, it doesn't show how much work it has been, but it has been a very, uh, a very um, challenging and enlightening work. When I started doing this, I knew nothing of enforcement and very basic things of forensic because they share things with population genetics or, or molecular techniques. And I have find it fascinating. And I also found that there is no end to, to wildlife crimes. The, the, the amount of, of things that are traded and trafficked, like the volumes, they are mind blowing. So for example, here, if you can see in the slide, just pangolin, over nine, 96,000 kilograms of pangolin scales have been seized or were seized in, in, 20, in 2018, 2019 in Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam. But it's, it's just incredible. There, there is no analysis really, for example, for proboscis monkeys or, or even macaques, even for the, for the medical uses. And, and the thing is that the uh, the criminals they they progress as as technology progresses and as and as time goes on they diversify their routes and the modes of delivery they incorporate money laundering which is a very very difficult thing to 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 trail it goes by fashion sometimes pangolin is right now still pangolin is, is the most uh, trafficked mammal in the world but right now we're seeing a big trend on people trading porcupine wheels what for it's it's just like fashion things come and go and fluctuate online crime has no end really uh, between whatsapp group facebook group instagram groups all of that has been monitored and is being monitored by our, by the intelligence unit that we set up at the Sabo wildlife department um how they source their methods um, how, how they source the things, what are their methodologies? They go and recruit people that clearly is in need. There is an economic need, a social, uh, socioeconomic need. Um, there is also a behavioral pressure because some people were used to be hunters and, and, and they want to kind of, of, of continue that. Uh, so, so they exploit those, those, uh, traits and trends of society and and basically it seems that we will never be able to stop to stop wildlife crimes so that's how i became a conservationist i found my et guy and you in japan should be very aware of what this is i i came across this like 3 or 4 years ago and and it really made things click click inside me my icky guy now is that I am a conservationist who really likes primates, but also likes uh, scientific work, not necessarily to do it myself, but to collaborate with people so that then I can facilitate resources, uh, places, uh, infrastructure, funding. I, I like to do that. I like to help others to do what they can do. And with that, if with that, I can help with the conservation of wildlife and primates that I love. I, I, I am very happy. So I think I have found my ikigai in conservation. Um, enforcement really is something I like. Uh, diseases that are linked to wildlife that could be spread through um, bushmeat trade. That's I. I think that whole area is is really really interesting, and and that's what I've been doing for the past four years. That was the background I I had to reach to this stage, and 
what I can say now is just my advice, if there is any, if, if it's for whatever it's worth, is that people need to be flexible and be able to change their career paths. Just embrace what is needed and what is coming at you and don't feel uh, afraid of stepping out of the comfort zone. I, I've been stepping out of that comfort zone and, and my comfort zone has been expanding and expanding and, and I will move on and, and get into all these things with the, with the audio mods and the acoustic monitoring, which is a very interesting thing. And I have no idea, but I will go into that. Um, and to do that, I, I need to keep establishing collaborations with people that know, with experienced partners. It has been an absolute pleasure to, to work with all these people like Andrew. Um, now, I hope with, with Michael and and to do to do change, to even if it's a tiny bit, we need to, to work closely with, with the authorities. We think that the authorities should be doing something. But when you start working with them very closely, then you see their actual needs, what what the people in the ground need, not what the director said that should be done. If if you work from the bottom up, change can happen. And and then we just have to keep asking and seeing what are their problems and, and how we can help them address them and, and solve them. Um, so that's it. Just step out of your comfort zone and, and find your ikigai. So thank you. Amazing story. Thanks, Milena. Yeah, great, Milena. Thank you. Very important message for everybody, for me as well. I, I, I learned a lot from, from your experiences. Thanks so much for sharing. It was a pleasure. I, I am not a primatologist, and I honestly, I felt very ashamed to find my name within uh, people that are really big <laughs> in primatology. Uh, I, was, I was taken aback, but I hope... This is something that is useful for, for students and for others that um, just need to move with the flow a bit and, and embrace what, what, what comes at you. Yeah, right. I think you sure. made, made the most of, of every talent you've you've had from, from a very young age. I, I don't know if your swimming expertise helps you avoid <laughs> wild, wild, wild <laughs> crocodiles <laughs> in the river or not, but maybe... Hopefully not. Someday I did it that once. Really, I did it once, and and I shouldn't have done it. Yes, I <laughs> I swam. I cross a tributary. Don't do that if you're ever in Kinabatagan. Yeah, I am the health and safety officer, and I strongly forbid you to do that. So again, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and all of our graduate students in the audience, just pretend you didn't hear any of that. Yeah, except yeah. for the part you shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I would like to open this up to um, anyone who might have questions. Uh, we're free to to take some time now. And so anyone in the audience here in Zoom, uh, I got my eye on um, on on YouTube as well. So maybe to get us started, uh, I I was pretty impressed to see the work you've been putting in for the forensics part of that lab. So we we've kind of been working together a little bit in, with. Uh, using that lab in some of our um, parasitological work um, with people like Liz and, uh, uh, but yeah, I wasn't sure how much that was going. Um, so congratulations, first of all, on getting that, that started. I, I think it'll be super, super important for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Right now the forensic unit is in full, uh, in full throttle. Uh, we have cases from, the Department of Customs, we have cases from the Forestry Department, we have cases from the Sabo Wildlife Department. And, and of course, the accreditation is for certain methods. So our intention is to develop perhaps new methods uh, and that eventually we can validate and, and have them accredited to be used for proper cases. So it has mm -hmm. been a, a big, a big, big, uh, a big effort. It was a big effort. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So does that, do you now have like, I, I guess that's the only place in Saba, right, where you have this capability? And Yes, for wildlife forensics, yes. Um, yeah. The There are other accredited labs that can do some sorts of, of 
forensic work. So we do DNA wildlife forensics, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very specific to that. Uh, so in in Borneo, it's the only lab that can do DNA wildlife forensics. We're helping right now the Sarawak Forestry Corporation to develop their own uh, with uh, obviously with a partnership of, of Trace Wildlife Forensic Network, who have been a huge, huge collaborator for us to establish our own. Yeah, that's really great. We, we actually have one um, person in the audience, a student with us at the Wildlife Research Center who's doing wildlife forensics in Africa. Uh, I think focusing on rhino, uh, rhinoceros, so doing some work at um, zoos in Japan just to look at the genetic structure. And so he had right. some experience also. I don't know, Mohammed, if you want to mention anything here. I think he's here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sose. Yeah, uh, in fact, I, I had a question. First of all, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Professor Malena. Yeah, as uh, Sense said, like I'm from Tanzania, I'm working with Forensic Lab in Tanzania. So like the Wildlife Forensic Lab here is, we are just starting, we are just setting up the lab now. The process underway to just uh, procure the machines and uh, install the machine and then to uh, start doing the work. But one of the challenge has been like for the accreditation when it comes to the wildlife forensics lab. And that is because actually with wildlife forensics, they, there is no like what I can say, like the control or the proficient testing, things like that. And that is because if you just go to the ISO 17025, there are some requirements that for you to be accredited, you need to be performing like the proficient testing, you need to have like uh, validated methods, you need to have in place like uh, uh, the controls for the analysis that you will be doing. So from our experience here in Africa, it has been a challenge like we don't have the facility where maybe we can just purchase or order for the proficient testing so that to validate like the whole workflow of our lab. So I was very much interested like to learn like the the milestone that you have reached when it comes to the uh the accreditation or the setup of the forensic lab in Borneo. I think that's my question because like it has been a very big challenge when it comes to accreditation. And then I read all the information that we have so far is like for now, it is very difficult to accredit wildlife forensics labs. Yeah. So your talk is very, very interesting. Well, thank you. Yes. Um it is indeed a challenge to have all the all the proficiency tests, all the method validation, all the quality management system uh, yeah. with all the equipment that needs to be calibrated and serviced and, and we have to have SOPs, forms, uh, everything. So it, it has been a real challenge. So I, I, I understand what you're going through and I will be very happy to chat with you separately about that and put you in touch with people from Trace Wildlife Forensic Network who actually help develop uh, forensic wildlife forensic laboratories and they have a strong foothold in, Af in in Africa. So maybe it will be good for you to contact them if you're not already. Yeah, that would be my pleasure to, to, to chat after this uh, seminar. Thank you so much. No for problem. Time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so Great. Much. So there's a there's a question in the chat from Fadel here. Um, I don't know, Fadel, if you want to elaborate on that or if we can just let me let answer it as is. Uh, so, uh, hello, um, Dr. Milena, I'm Fadel and I'm working on um, eagles, uh, white-tailed eagles in Hokkaido and Europe. And I'm doing population genetics. Um, and I've seen um, outputs, visual, visualization of basin structures, and usually it's like two-dimensional, but yours mm -hmm. I saw it like <laughs> kind of three-dimensional and um, I was wondering what kind of um, software was for, for, for it. Thank you. Uh, let me find it. Uh, let me see if I find it. And, uh... I think that's when you were look, talking about the population genetic structure of, orang of proboscis monkeys across, or orangutans, sorry, across um, Sabah. Uh, right. That one? Uh, sorry, no, it's not that one. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Stop. it's that one. It was that one with the with the bars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, basically, I uh, that is actually just Excel. Okay. Uh, you, you just uh, basically get the information from structure, right. the the, pro the program structure, mm -hmm. uh, and you get the the probabilities of 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 uh, assigned uh, assign population assignment. Right. There is a population assignment that comes from structure and it's in its percentages of how 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 much this particular individual um can or could belong to this population, this population, or this population. So basically you take that and you just have to graph it in Excel and do some fancy work on Excel to make a 3D graph instead of a double. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Any other questions? I like that sometimes the uh, the classics come in for the win there as I'll repeat <laughs> repeat myself wow. in the chat. <laughs> Do we have any um, other questions? So maybe while we're waiting, um, you said something really important as well, which is you it's become really important for you to kind of take the science and turn it into actions, and you have. I know through DGFC and through the Saba Wildlife Department, you have a lot of interaction with the authorities in Saba. Um, sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. But maybe you could just comment on, um, like, do you have any good examples of wins? So these, for example, you have these uh, action plans, these roadmaps for different species, but maybe either it's something like that or something else, if you could just kind of comment on. So I think as budding conservationists, if we have any in the audience, it's always good to hear those kind of wins and especially yeah. win-wins, right? Where, um, where, where it's kind wins. of additive in Everybody that sense. Yeah. Fun. So I wonder if you have any any good examples from your time there. Um, well, I think that that this I this we're calling it the INL project because it's funded by the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs Bureau. So we call it INL project instead of the boosting enforcement and concurrency capacity. Blah blah. blah it's a very long title. So through the INL project, I think. We have managed that. It's like we took the information from the field, from what was coming uh, from the camera traps on the band things, from the um, coloring and 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 genetics of the proboscis monkeys, uh, from from the monitoring of the clouded leopards, and 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 that was discussed heavily with stakeholders people who may not have understood or had their perceptions about, no, these animals are fine or they are not fine. They all came together in a room and discussed what were the real issues. And we had people from tourism, from, from government agencies, from, from scientific backgrounds. And that, that makes a very rich conversation that gives a lot of perspective that, that you lack. If you're only doing uh, academic research, you're lacking the rest of the picture. So when they said, okay, definitely you need we need to put more more uh more emphasis on getting people properly trained for uh intelligence collection, for example, or for forensic work, we went for that. And the Savo government was very supportive, not only Savo Wildlife Department, we have had uh agencies that include the marine police the maritime enforcement agency the malaysian multimedia communications uh the anti-corruption commission from malaysia so people really came together through this inl project to deliver training to officers and 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 there were things that started to be noticed since the beginning uh there was someone trying to bribe a uh, wildlife department officer. He immediately went to work with an officer from the anti-corruption commission, and they set up something and they caught this person. So it, it's it's a it's an example of how this little network uh, can expand and and create an impact. And 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 then the intelligence unit they have been dismantling things. Uh, they have been stopping uh, stopping people that are actively uh poaching or trafficking it's it's it is a little thing but those little deterrents uh or those little actions can 
can be seen as big deterrents for others. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a win-win for the government. They people, the, the public has a good perception of the government that they are doing things. The wildlife actually gets the benefit of, oh, at least there is one person less doing this. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's a win-win. There are other things that definitely still need to be addressed uh, in terms of, of providing alternative, alternative sources of income and more education about why um, uh, having a pet is not a, a, a monkey as a pet is not a good idea there, there are definitely things that need to be to be there to complete the picture and, and make a, 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 a longer lasting impact but it is happening it, it, it happens uh, even if it's a tiny bit uh, taking one person or two out of of the streets that is trafficking and trading is is already a win for for, for everyone because um, sometimes, and that is why, if you ask me why is the international narcotics and law enforcement affairs funding this, is because these type of of crimes, the wildlife crimes, are are seriously and and and, and very directly linked with narco traffic, drug trafficking, and and people trafficking, human trafficking. So mm -hmm. by by curbing some of the of the trade routes that are for wildlife, that also puts deterrence on on routes that are for trading other other commodities, sadly including people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really really crazy. Thank you. It sounds like we, what you've done in four years is more than many academics have done in their careers on practical terms. A, a lot of papers <laughs> produce very few results, very few outcomes that impact a, a large group of people. And I think, I think you, you, you definitely took the right path for all of us. <laughs> well, it, it was a path, and I wish I, a part of me wish I had continued with academia because I do enjoy it. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of value in all the baseline information that comes from yeah. academia. It yeah. can never be underestimated how much knowing how the phosphorylation pattern in tyrosines in macrophages act with dengue virus. Can even that's what <laughs> must, my 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 bachelor degree was that uh, mm -hmm. that could eventually lead to something that helps for uh, dengue virus. Uh, prevention, for example. So I don't think it's it's fair to compare what you academics do with what conservationists do. It's, I think they're absolutely complementary and, and cannot go be, yeah. without being hand in hand. Yeah. Well, I hope in the near future, I can drag you back into a little part of academia and we can, you can drag us into practical use from what we're, we hope to work on in Malaysia with you. It will be a pleasure. Um, I, I do keep thinking about that project about diet of, of places, uh, diet in, in especially for monkeys in in the restoration plots that we have in, in near Dino Caring Food Center. So we also do restoration ecology. There, there are many things that are done in DGFC and I didn't touch on that. Uh, but definitely it will be interesting to, to incorporate into the uh, plants that are being used for restoration, some that are actually more of a of, of diet beneficials from the diet point of view of, of primates. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think that's a good place to, to stop here. So Milena, thank you again so much for sharing your story with us. Um, Thanks to you. And I'm you. so sorry for the delay. I got confused with the time zone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has to know. Nobody has to know. <laughs> uh, now everyone knows. So thank you. <laughs> now everyone knows. Thanks. So Let me stop the, the stream here.